Good afternoon. I'm just waiting a few more minutes to see if we can get a few more folks signed on and then we'll kick it off in, in just a few more moments. Thank you. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we are here today to discuss Knight Foundation's Grants Administration Department and how the GA team, Grants Admin, uh, supports you and your grant making as grantees. I understand that this session has been open to both active grantees and past grantees. Uh, for those who have not engaged with our system in the past, I hope this information is very relevant to you and can help you in any future ask that you're uh, looking to, to bring to the foundation. And for those of you who have received grants from us and are active or past grantees of ours, I hope um, this information is not only refreshing, but also might give you a different perspective or, or some more insight into um, into your grant making and, and how you can be a more active participant in that uh, with us. So with that, I will start to share my screen and we'll kick off with this deck. Any questions, please feel free to add to the, the chat box. Um, I'll be monitoring on my own. So I, I thank you in advance for your patience as I get to those questions. And here we go. Okay. So, the Grants Administration team, we have our logo uh, that we it, we want to share with everybody. Um, internally, everyone is already aware of it, but it's something that we're very proud of. Uh, guided by integrity, we turn big ideas into smart investments. We're the behind the scenes organization uh, uh, entity of the foundation that, that really um, carries the grant through the, through the entire grant making process. And, and intervenes and supports wherever we can to ensure that both uh, your, the grantees experience and the internal staff's experience is smooth and we'll go through it um, through these slides. So what does the grants administration team do? Uh, the GA team, we support the entire grant making process as mentioned from registration to grant closures. We're really the architects of the workflow process, uh, the process in which the grant flows uh, from, from again the registration to the actual approved granted status to then uh, closed out once it's ready to be closed. We oversee and guide all of our grants from start to finish. We managed a variety, actively manage a variety of different um, points and touch bases, including profile management. We ensure that our database makes sense, it's relevant and it's active um, and, and is, is easy to use for everyone. So database administration, database design, we schedule your reports, we schedule your payments and we process them. We do grant compliance, trainings, technical support. So there's really a, a vast variety of items that we can support you in. Um, hi, Marcus. Okay, I just noticed you went on mute, perfect. Uh, so really, um, we, we touch base on a bunch of different points in the workflow, both internally and externally. The final point that I really wanna highlight is we do offer technical assistance and technical support. Uh, so anytime there's any um, questions or issues or just some guidance that anyone would like to have in terms of how to interact with our Flux systems, or with any other parts of the foundation in general, um, everyone can always email our intake uh, email called uh, grants at kf.org. 
And of course, you'll hear it about 50 more times during this presentation, but we'll make sure that we triage your question appropriately and, and is sent to the right person to make sure that we're able to get you the correct answer. Who forms the Grants Administration Department? So we have our fearless leader, Rochelle Rinkins, uh, Hallie Atkins, our officer, myself, Vicky Checo as an officer. We also have Nicole Quillar, who just joined our team and we're super excited about. And we also have Olga Rodriguez, who is our associate. On top of this information, so I actually pulled these photos and, and this page from our website. Uh, many folks don't know, but our entire staff page is available on the Knight Foundation website. If ever there's any questions as to who's part of um, any program team or who's, who's part of the foundation in general, any contact information, um, you can always find it on our staff page. Now that you know who we are, let's talk about how the Grants Administration helps support you and your work. So as a team, we're an integral part in the grant making process. We work behind the scenes to make sure that your experience is seamless, effective, and respons responsive. Again, any questions, any concerns, or just general check-ins can always be sent to grants at kf.org. If there's a situation where you might have a new relationship manager, grants at kf.org. There's a question about you submitting any uh, reports, grants at kf.org. Uh, and really what you have on the right side is just a, a little pizza uh, breakup of all the other pieces in which we we touch point with your grant behind the scenes. So um, grants at KF, we have our letter of inquiries, flux access as the architects, we manage all of that, due diligence, grant agreements, payments, and reporting. Let me just see if we have any questions. No questions so far. We also support your grants by ensuring that the information is accurate. As the architects of the Flux system, we want to make sure that all of our data is complete and is relevant. So part of that is to ensure that our organizational documents are up to date and uploaded in the appropriate places, that we have the correct banking and information, uh, banking and payment information for our grantees as we start to move towards a fully EFT process. Um, we also want to make sure that the Flux access and the user management is up to date especially as we start to talk about um, institutions and longstanding institutions. There's turnover, it's bound to happen. We wanna make sure that the outgoing members of your team, um, we, that we're able to sunset their access and we're able to keep active the folks that are, that are actually working on your grants um, to ensure a level of confidentiality, but also to make sure that, that it's only your team working on your grants. Um, and part of how we do that is to open the lines of communication with our grantees to make sure that they feel comfortable enough and, and know that we wanna know this information and they're able to share it with us when there is any change in the staff or um, uh, change in priorities or if just someone else needs to have access to the portal to see what the organization is doing with Knight. We also, um, we develop documents and we track them and that can range from uh, grant agreements to amendments. Uh, just in general, we, we try to make sure that our Flux system houses all of the relevant information so that way we can provide the best service to you as a grantee and also ensure that the foundation is in a, is in a position to really um, capture its learnings. And again, we offer technical assistance. Again, for the maybe 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th time today, grants at kf.org. Uh, next, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull up our grantee portal. So we'll be seeing, we'll be walking through what you see as a grantee. And as I'm pulling that up, feel free to add any questions on the chat. Okay. Now, so this is our grantee portal. Our grantee portal is um, very specific and tailored to your organization and your level of access. We do understand that there are cases, especially with uh, grant writers who might, uh, who might interact with a, a variety of different grantees. The way that our system works right now is one person can have access to one organization. So once you're able to log on to your Flux system, you'll see at the top the name of your organization. Um, 
Oya Chico Enterprises is a is a personal um, uh, kind of dummy one that I've made within the system, uh, very Miami in terms of its name. Um, it's not a real organization. To preserve the confidentiality of all of our grantees, we chose not to use an active grant or, or just any of our, our grantees. Um, so what you'll see on the left-hand side is, and we'll, we'll go section by section, we have the information, apply for funding. This will be the page that you'll go to if you want to submit a new letter of inquiry to the foundation. So you'll click on this page, it'll show this landing page to you, and then you'll click on this green button. Click here to submit a new letter of inquiry. Once you hit that, it'll open up. Once it's loading, it'll open you up to our letter of inquiry. You'll be able to go in section by section and make your edits appropriately. If there's a fiscal agent or fiscal sponsor, what will you be doing with these funds? And what results do you expect to achieve? Once your letter of inquiry is submitted, and we wanna make sure that this portion is also completed, the more information you can give us, the better. Once it's submitted, and you'll hit down here, save and close. You'll be able to review it and then submit it finally. You can add some additional notes for a specific um, relationship manager that you're hoping will read this. And then it'll be, it'll be um, excuse me, um, sent to the relationship manager to review your letter of inquiry. If they'd like to learn more about your project or um, give you an opportunity to explain a little bit more, they will invite you for a full proposal. In the immediate, during the letter of inquiry phase, there are only two questions that are being asked, those that we just looked at. What will you do with the funds and what are the outcomes you expect to achieve? And that's submitting your letter of inquiry within the flux process. You also have underneath the reporting templates and here you can download our budget templates to help you with your submission and the preparation of your proposal. Once you click on this, it will open up a box link and allow you to download the Excel form that you'll be using for your budget. If anyone again has any issues accessing this form while in the portal, always and feel free to email grantsatkf.org and we'll be, we'll be sure to troubleshoot in the immediate as long as it's within office hours. Uh, so we have our year one, year two, and year three. All of our Excel, all of our um, budgetary documents like this one comes pre kind of preset with the three years and also a tab for the total organization tab. Per the instructions that you'll see in the beginning under best practices, organizational budgets are required for any grant that's above $250,000. We do accept um, a budget that has been approved by your board in whatever um, format you have it in. Let me scroll this over. Any format that you have it in. So if you already happen to have it in a PDF format, we will accept that. If you don't have it, you can always utilize this form as a, as a guide. Through that same vein, if your grant is more than three years and you need to add additional tabs, you can always right click it once it's in the Excel form, you can right click it and copy and duplicate those tabs accordingly to the term of your grant. If it's a five-year grant, you wanna make sure to add two extra tabs and copy all of this information. Once you're filling this out, what information would you be entering? So you'll enter your organizational name, your grant ID number, and the reporting period from start to finish. This should follow the reporting period that you are using to note take your own expenses for the purposes of this grant. So if the grant is supposed to go from January to December and it's a three-year grant, we wanna see reporting period from January of such year to December of such year. And the following tab two would be January from the following year to January of the ending following year. Uh, just so we're able to, to make sure that it's aligned with the information that we currently have in Flux. You also want to focus on just the proposed. If you're talking about an active proposal, something that's not yet granted, we want to focus on the proposed column only. And you'll be listing your individual contributions, your foundation grants. Foundation grants, which is already highlighted, is where you would put the Knight Foundation portion. And on the bottom is where you'll enter your expenses. 
you'll notice per the instructions on the, the best practices tab that we do not allow for any expenses of overhead that total more than 10% of the overall total of your grant. So what we would wanna see, it's not that overhead expenses are not allowed, but we do cap them at 10%. And we also want to make sure that we know what is getting involved. What is, what, what is your overhead expenses covering for your organization? So there are a few lines down here that would allow you to explain. You can also do the same for the other section. Ideally, what we're looking for every year and what I look for during the due diligence process while I'm overseeing and reviewing your documents, um, I want to make sure that the annual payout that we're seeing in, in the example of, of a $250,000 grant, say it's a three-year grant, year one, year two is $100,000, year three is $50,000. We want to see year one, the totals of $100,000, what you will do with that. Year two, the next payment of $100,000, what you will do with that. Year three, $50,000, and what you will do with that. So it should align with the payment structure that's expressed to you by your relationship manager. Ha assuming that you've gone beyond the point of, of an LOI, now you're in the full proposal process. Doing a quick check for chats. No questions so far. Okay. And so that is our budget document. I'm gonna close out of here and go back to the portal and we'll keep going down the uh, task bar. After reporting, reporting templates, we have our FAQ section with some frequently asked questions that we've put together based on the questions that we get through our Zendesk or any questions that we've just heard often in the, in, across the foundation. Again, if there's any questions that you have that are not reflected here, always, always, and I hope you do, uh, take advantage of the grants at kf.org um, um, resource and we'll make sure that we get you the correct answer in a timely manner. You can also email your relationship manager directly. Going down the list now, we're looking at people. What you'll see with people is we wanna make sure that your information is correct. Folks leave, folks change, your contact information might change. Even within the same organization, your building might move, your phone number might adjust, your email might be different depending on, on how your, your um, database works. So we wanna make sure we have the appropriate information, especially because as an active grantee, we'll be sending you requirements for uh, reporting, requirements for your payments. We wanna make sure that we're reaching you at the best um, at the best area possible to make sure that our communication is efficient and, and really quickly. Uh, what we would hate to have is, is outdated information and we're trying to contact someone for say a payment and a payment gets delayed because there's a disconnect in what we have in our systems versus the information that you're operating with. So again, open lines of communication in terms of, of who's working where and what's the best way to contact that person to be able to continue the operations of your grant is ideal. Moving down from the people section, we have our organization section. This is another one. We always wanna make sure we have the updated information for your organization. We wanna ensure that we have your correct address, your correct phone number, your correct email address. Uh, we we wanna know who we're working with just as much as we wanna make sure that our grantees know who is who's working with them so it's 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 good practice that we found we just want to make sure that we know we know everything that we need to know about you and and we're not um, misrepresenting you within our systems scrolling down you'll see uh, requests so this is anything that's within the system that is not active or not yet granted um, and what we're seeing here, these are all dummy grants. Um, they're not real ones. So pending request is anything that is still pending and then decline request self-explanatory is anything that has been declined. So you'll be able to really see the differentiations between the two and you'll, it'll, um, it's a way for our grantees to engage with our, our relationship managers in an organized way. So what you'll see during pending requests are the three active requests that Oyo Chico Enterprises has uh, with the Knight Foundation. You'll be able to see the grant ID number, which is something that we always ask from our grantees to share with us in any communications to make sure that we're um, speaking about the same thing. Um, the amount that has been recommended by the foundation to the grantee so that we know what number we're working with. 
the grant title and a brief summary or explanation. Again, similar to the LOI process, you'll be able to drop down and open up to see all the other sections of your request. And then we also have the documents and information section. This section was not made available during the LOI process. This section opens up once we already know that your grant is going, going to be going through the workflow process. And here is where we, we gather all of your organizational documents. Uh, we gather, if you're a nonprofit, we gather your um, board of directors, your 990s, your audits after a certain amount, uh, your tax IDs, if you're a for-profit organization, your W-9s, um, your verification of uh, um, corporation status with your, with your respective state. So this is where we'll save all of the information, including your um, proposed budget and any relevant documents that would become necessary for the evaluation of your grant or just the overall documentation of what's happening uh, to make sure that we are, we're all aware of the great work that's being done by our grantees. And again, you can go through each one. If there is something that is currently within your queue as the grantee to complete, you'll notice that the edit button becomes available to you. If it's within a workflow step that is now uh, relying on an internal staff to take care of something, for example, this one, you will not see an edit button. I just wanna make that clear again. Anything that's within your queue you will see an edit button and anything that's not, the edit button will disappear. It's really organized in a way to share the division of labor throughout our workflow process. Uh, to reiterate, if I did not, if I was not clear before, our workflow process is the process by which our grant moves through. So it, it goes from the LOI process to the approval, to the um, a full proposal process, to an approval process, to like the final threads. And then once it becomes granted, we release it. From the LOI process to the granted process, there's a lot of conversations that happens in between. Obviously, there's a lot of back and forth, a lot of ideation, uh, and a lot of ironing out of details. So really the workflow is, is intended to help organize that process and to again, um, uh, raise up the clarity in the division of labor, who is responsible for what, and when it is your turn to take care of an item within the proposal process, the edit button will appear. Decline request becomes very helpful, I would say, for, for anyone who has submitted something and, and you just want to see what's your history with the foundation. What have I submitted to the foundation? What was accepted? What wasn't accepted? Um, who submitted this? If, if, if you're coming in new uh, to this portal, you'll be able to see everything that was submitted by your organization and to see what went through or what didn't. Uh, and this is the request phase. Once something becomes granted, active, we're going to pay it out and we're going to engage in this work, it moves towards the grant phase. So we have again our active and our closed. Once a grant becomes active, you cannot make any edits. Everything is locked in flux. And you'll be able to see the entire uh, proposal that was submitted for approval. Taking a moment to check the chat. Okay. Moving on, we have our requirement section. And this is broken down by reports due and reports submitted. With these two sections, what you'll notice is it's all of the requirements across all of your grants in one place. It will not separate if you have multiple grants that are active, which is where your grant ID is very, very important to make sure that you're responding to the appropriate grant. You'll notice for this one, these are all the same grant IDs. So we know that it's for the same grant. And there is a variety of different uh, requirements that you will have. These requirements will also be laid out to you in your grant agreement that gets sent out via DocuSign for your signature. That grant agreement uh, should let you know what is expected of you and when it's expected to be submitted and we'll also give you the link and guidelines for you to sign up for your Flux account and to access your Flux account so you can submit these through this portal. Again, anything that's within your queue will show as new 
And once you submit it, it'll show review uh, under review by the relationship manager. If your relationship manager has additional questions for you, they will send it back to you for more answers. And that status will no longer say new, it will show pending grantee response, which means it's your turn, the grantee, to log back into Flux and to answer any questions that the relationship manager has posed for you in their evaluation of your submitted reports. So we have our agreement, which at this point, it's pretty straightforward. We send you the agreement and we upload the signed version into this card. And once your grant becomes active, every year as a default, we assign, we schedule an interim sum summary and a financial report. So interim summary and a financial report. These will accompany um, each other prior to every single payment, unless your relationship manager has asked for a different type of report or if we're asking for additional information. And this is where your agreement comes in handy because it'll let you know what is dependent on what. Uh, which payments are dependent on which reports and which outstanding reports are still there. This will also let you know if there's any overdue reports. Our system does send you uh, um, emails, automatic emails, to let you know if a report has been marked as overdue 30, 60, 90 days. And once you log in here, you'll be able to access it and submit it. Again, edit button. Save and close. A really cool feature that I wanna highlight is save and continue. If you're not ready to submit your report, if you're still looking for, um, for data pieces, if you are, are working on it in the meantime while you're working on something else and you're not ready to, to save a final, final version, but you wanna save where you are at that point, you can hit save and continue. It will stay exactly the same. You'll notice that the buttons have not moved anywhere but it'll allow you to, to document what you have already written in there. Save and close will completely close the form and the submit button will appear. Once you submit, you can send a note. Is it okay? Oh. And now your report was submitted and it'll be locked for you and is now under review for your relationship manager. In the same vein of what we're seeing in the other sections, we have reports due, anything that's outstanding. We also have reports submitted. So you can always see what was submitted in the past by your organization. This becomes very helpful as we start to talk about endowment reports for those of you that have endowments with Knight. We do ask for annual endowment reports and that one report kind of end and start with the next one and there's some consistency. If you are a new member of your organization and you have to submit an endowment report, this becomes very helpful for you to see what has been submitted in the past so you can build on those reports moving forward. Uh, for those that are not specific to endowments and, and are coming in fresh and need to submit some new reporting, especially if you have multiple years, looking at your report submitted can help you understand better where you left off on your prior report and where you need to move on for your next report coming up. And then the final section is our payment section. We have our scheduled payments and you also have your paid payments. Scheduled payments, self-explanatory, anything that's scheduled out in the future. And you'll also be able to see the status. And then we also have our paid payments. This can also be very helpful for those of you who are undergoing an audit and would need to see what has been paid out within a specific year or what has been paid out throughout the course of your relationship with Knight. And this concludes the, the training. And I'm gonna close out the grantee portal right now. I see we have a lot more members who have signed on. Welcome, hi. I hope everyone was able to um, uh, see the slides and the information that we shared before. If there's a specific question that you have, I'm happy to go over anything again. Please feel free to add it to the chat. 
We have about 30 more minutes in this session. Uh, so we ended a little bit early, but I will be here until 3 p.m. Available. Are you, Hi. are you, um, are you sort of waiting for office hour kind of a thing? Yeah. Um, I don't know if, well, I see a couple of folks are still on, but I don't know if you've got to talk a little bit about the financial documents. So I did go over the budget okay. template and yeah. um, the proposal section, what, what we're looking for that the, um, it should reflect the annual payout that each year should should reflect the the amount that they're expected to get that year. Also that the start and end date should reflect that as well. Um, I went over overhead expenses and explaining those overhead expenses. Are there any other pieces you think I should review? Well, the folks are still on I'll prompt if there are anyone has any questions around the financial reports. Cause I know oftentimes in the back and forth, um, it's almost like, how to how to how to actually when it gets to like maybe biannual reporting like how to properly submit like what you've done so far and sometimes there's questions around like the time period and how much you got versus how does that then add up so I don't know if anybody has questions around that or um, that's just one thing I thought maybe sure well, I can open this up. Um, but if no one has questions around that, I also, I mean, it's your session here. <laughs> You're open. Um, Lillian, quick question. Oh, sorry. One sec. Okay. While Lillian is uh, uh, responding to that, I can definitely go back and pull up the financial document. Um, So again, as mentioned, the financial document should reflect uh, and will, will be coincided in, in terms of um, how it's scheduled. It will accompany an interim statement. So you'll have an opportunity to explain the, the narrative portion, the, the actual activities that were done uh, through the, the interim statement and in terms of um, any write-ups that you'd like to accompany with the financial document. The financial document should show the expenses that you incurred or any expenditures that happen throughout that time frame. So if it's an annual report, if it's a biannual report, you wanna make sure that you indicate, excuse me, the start and the end date of your expenditures on the top during reporting period. So if we're looking at a, a July 1st to June 30th or a January to December, or um, uh, um, if you happen to get your grant during an off cycle, as we do rolling, rolling grants throughout the year, um, we want to make sure that that you know there is a place where you can explain that. Um, I do know also as a former grantee, ex uh, uh, explicitly writing out your start and end dates for expenditures become very helpful during the audit process. Um, so if there's any questions as a, um, in terms of what you should re be reporting on, or where you can start to see where the start and end dates would coincide, I would highly recommend you look at the start and end dates on your grant agreement, a PDF of your grant agreement, to see uh, um, when can you start documenting those, ex when, you, when can you start document, when can you start to document those expenses on your books and also on these financial documents. So essentially it should be a mirror of the same And again, you um, you have the opportunity to add additional tabs if you need more tabs than just the three that are made available here. Hi, uh, I'm just looking at the questions coming in from Julia. Hi, Julia. Um, <laughs> Sorry, you were like shut down and I'm just like coming in afterwards. <laughs> no, no, that's totally fine. That's totally fine. Please ask away. I actually didn't realize my mic was on the entire time. So I'm glad I didn't, you know, no, 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 no. music. It's fine. <laughs> um, you know, I figured I was just like, oh, you know, sessions. It's fine. Um, yeah. So what's up? Okay, so you have questions through about your fiscal sponsorship work. Okay. Who is your fiscal sponsor? The Miami Foundation. Uh, they're wonderful. It's just, you know, it, it definitely, 
if if we were going to redo it, I would prefer it to be a little bit more streamlined, just because it's two systems, and then like going through them, ask questions to you, and the, you know. <laughs> Um, That's totally understandable. So the fiscal sponsorship situation is a little bit more delicate because you are officially the grantee of the Miami Foundation by way of the Knight Foundation. So yeah, you wouldn't yeah. have access to our flux systems directly as the grantee. You would have to coordinate through the Miami Foundation. And we do. Yeah. It works. Sorry. Um, but I was thinking like going, I was just like, if I were going to do like if we were gonna restructure it, if we were gonna do it in another community, I was wondering when you work with another fiscal sponsor, do you always work, have that fiscal sponsor have their own, like, is it is it a case by case system in terms of fiscal sponsorship? Is there like a, a, a different way that you've worked before in the past? Does that make so sense? I've seen like, it, yeah, I've seen it happen both ways. I have seen organizations use a fiscal sponsor on a one-time project. Uh, and it might be a one-time project that has a bunch of different components, which is why they set up the fiscal sponsorship. And then I'll, I've also seen where it's an entity that just decided they're going to operate under a fiscal sponsorship uh, because the fiscal sponsorship offers so many, um, offers a lot of support in terms of like housekeeping, back end, admin, HR, things like that. So it's really up to the organization if they want to maintain that relationship as part of their structure, or if they're going to use the convenience of a fiscal sponsor for a specific project. I've, I've seen it happen both ways. That's helpful. So, yeah, it's the fiscal sponsor's decision. You know, sometimes a lot of our fiscal sponsors have been just passed through. So we give them a percentage for just running the grant or whatever. And then it usually, then we're responsible for all the reporting and things like that, which is fine. It's right. actually, but when we do it through two systems, that's when it starts to add up in terms of our um, administration and accounting and all that stuff. Totally. Um, I do know the Miami Foundation works on a national scale. So if there's an event that you're doing outside of um, the city that you're originally working in, um, and you would have to talk to them about it, but I believe they are able to extend your relationship to the new location. So you don't have to create a new relationship with a different fiscal sponsor. Oh, and then wow. there are other fiscal sponsors um, that, that I've seen that if that's your structure, if that's built within your structure, you'll just uh, um, kind of submit all of your, your grants via that same fiscal sponsorship. So it'll be like more of an organizational uh, component as opposed to like a programmatic component. That's helpful. So yeah, I'm like just running more than one of the months. So most of our work is my, that is my focus is running through them, but we could run more than one of them. Mm, okay. Yeah, definitely. And then that can also uh, help uh, in terms of negotiations. Um, it might just be cleaner for you to use one fiscal sponsor throughout all of your projects. Hmm. Yeah, I definitely think that through that, that's really helpful. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Hmm. Good. This was helpful. <laughs> uh, I'm glad, and that's a question I didn't have prepared on my on my deck, so that's cool. That's okay. Yeah, I mean, well, what it what I, what ended up happening, to be honest, though, is that because getting set up and running stuff through them was was a lot more work than we had done in the past with other fiscal sponsors. It required us to like double up on the accounting budgeted originally, and so that's something you know, just when you're running fiscally sponsored projects, and it's a more formal, like more arduous accounting reporting back mm -hmm. thing. Um, it's helpful to know, like, to bump up that line because <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> um, right. yeah, so totally. Really cool. Totally. And also, um, we have worked with organizations who have had longstanding fiscal sponsorships with other organizations that were not the Miami Foundation. So mm -hmm. if it's a situation where the fiscal sponsorship is an organizational component, like, this is how we do our work. We process all of our grants through this organization what we would request is uh, an MOU, um, any active MOU that the grantee would have with that fiscal sponsor, and we'll just evaluate it with, with what we are able to offer by way of the Miami Foundation. So it's not impossible to come in with a different partner, uh, especially if it's a longstanding relationship. 
Yeah. Yeah. Great. Awesome. <laughs> and, and that's very helpful. And yeah, I would definitely love that presentation <laughs> since I'm yes. really missed out and you know, I have that. Yeah. Uh, the joy of missing out as well. Um, of missing out on of too, too many great presentations. So, great. Well, I hope the comms presentation was really good. I know Roshni was leading it. She's very engaging. Yeah, and it was hard to see how Knight is thinking through, you know, a little, a little less of the black curtain kind of in terms of like how they're structuring their comms and how they figure in. So, yeah, cool. All right, well, thank you. So I, uh, in terms of the presentation, you guys are going to email them out to all the, the people, or should I just reach out to you directly? Uh, you can reach out to me directly and I'll, I'll get more info. Uh, I believe they will also be available once all of this gets kind of wrapped up in a bow, once the sessions are over and, and the conference is over, it should all become public. Okay. But I will double check specifically for this session because um, I know it was in, originally intended for active grantees, but now it's been open to everybody. So uh, um, yeah. I will get back to you. <laughs> My email is uh, grant at kf.org. I'm grant oh. at kf. So I have it here. Checko at kf.org. Checko at kf.org. Yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Have a good day. Enjoying the conference. You're welcome.